Oh my gosh, look at that. Hello, this is a Power Macintosh G3 Molar Mac only released in the United States to education markets, and yeah, it's a bit of an odd duck. So let's take a look at this lovely machine. Now you may be thinking, Steve, you already talked about the G3 Molar Mac. Well, kind of, but not really. I did a very interesting video about finding a G3 all-in-one Macintosh just like this one in the e-waste dump, and that's not this one in particular. That one's over there in the corner. It actually used to be behind me on the set here. But this machine is different. This came to me very recently in sort of a dire state. And my friend Sean of Action Retro picked up its sibling, and he featured that on his channel. But his was labeled as working. Mine, not so much, as we'll see why in a moment. Now, when I saw this beige odd duck on eBay, I thought, I don't really need another one of these. I have one, and it works great. But spare parts? Mm, yeah, I guess that's a plausible reason to pick up another one of these 60-pound behemoths. I mean... I don't even know where I'm going to put this thing. But anyway, this was listed as, as is, not working. And the seller actually said that the battery had exploded inside and sent me some pictures. Of course, I couldn't be deterred by some actual scientific facts that this machine probably will never work again. No, I have to go and waste money and waste time and try and see if I can get these things to work again. Because that's just what we do here at Mac84. So I have no idea if this thing is salvageable. The pictures the eBay seller sent me are pretty gnarly, but I'm going to be opening this for the first time right here. And, well, strap in. I don't think this is going to be pretty. All right, so let's try and shift this over, and we can hopefully get a better look at it. Apologies if this is going to be out of focus for a little bit, because, um, yeah. Um, so there are four screws on the back. We're going to undo these, and this whole back should come out like a tray. So we'll see if we have any luck with that. There's also these slots on each side of the machine. I believe that's where you could put a document or paper holder there, but I've never actually seen that accessory. So if anyone has a picture of it or anything like that, that would be cool. Let me know in the comments section. They actually designed this so the machine could sit up pretty close to the wall. So if you were in a school setting and you had a row of these machines against the wall, the ports here are recessed enough where you could have plugs into them without worrying about too much distance being between the back of the machine and the wall. This originally came with an angled power cord, which plugged into here and followed this little track to neatly keep the cable tied up. I'm going to assume this came from a school because there's a terrible branding on the side of this thing. Mm, just cover that up there. Yeah, that looks better. Now the front of this machine may look goofy. However, it is complete function over form. There's a set of nice stereo speakers on the front, as well as two sets of headphone jacks so kids can plug in their headphones without worrying about bothering everyone else with the sound. This is something that they actually kept on the iMac G3 as well. You have a space for an iOmega zip drive, but this was only included on the higher end models or it was a build to order option. You also have a spot for a floppy drive that came standard. This machine came with a CD-ROM drive by default, but you could upgrade it to a DVD drive. Between the drives, you also have a volume up-down button, which makes it easy to adjust the volume. There's also a microphone right at the top of the screen, which is nice. So besides its bulbous beige appearance, you may be wondering why they call it a Molar Mac. Well, it's mostly due to the top of this thing, I think, because it really looks like the indentations of a tooth. And, I mean, I don't really know why they made it this way. <laughs> I mean, they could have just went a nice curve down, but it looks like butt cheeks or something. I don't know. It's a very strangely designed computer. If you take off the top of this, the metal is pretty flat. So I'm not exactly sure why they went with this Johnny Ive nightmare of a top here, but uh, at least it's semi-translucent. And look, someone tried to color on ours. Okay, so this whole back area is sort of like a drawer, and that should just pull out. <laughs> and I don't trust this plastic. Oh, there we go. Okay. That wasn't too terrible. I know it was opened up before because the seller sent me pictures, but... Yeah, this just sort of comes out here. Oh, I could see the rust already. Oh. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, there's just a bit of rust in this machine. Well, let's take the whole tray out so we get a better understanding of what's going on here. So to do that, we have to disconnect some cables. We have this power cable, and then we have the power supply cable. Then we have this I.O. cable that goes to the personality card. And we go 
looks like another power cable and a floppy drive. We have to probably disconnect that from the source. Be easier. And there are plastic clips. Well, oh, that plastic clip just broke. Well, to be expected. This is a stupid, stupid idea. Okay. So, one of those plastic pieces broke. This was sort of to hold this in before you pulled the whole thing out. And, uh, oh my gosh, look at that. That's all rust. I'm going to have to get a better photo with my phone. But, oh my god, that's terrible. Look at how much rust is in this thing. My goodness, what the heck happened to this computer? Oh gosh, I'm afraid to look at the logic board. Let's lift this hefty CRT onto this chair here. Oh, that's the most of the weight, obviously. And let's focus on looking at this logic board. All right, so it looks like the rust is here <laughs> next to the battery, and then it goes down to the CD-ROM drive. Oh my goodness, look at that. We got some on the IDE cable there. You can see this is where the, the plastic snapped off here. But it doesn't serve any real purpose other than to keep this tray locked into the machine. So, yeah, but this plastic is going to be super brittle just because, yay, old plastics. All right, so I'm going to try and remove this logic board from this chassis to see if there's any damage to the bottom of the board because it's hard to tell right now. I mean, oh, <laughs> uh, well, it could be worse, I guess. Let's take a closer look. Here's a quick tour of the back of the machine. We have a SCSI port. We have an ADB port for connecting your keyboard or mouse. We also have an Ethernet port. We have two serial ports and we have a monitor output, which is great for connecting to a projector or another monitor, etc. And this is where your personality card goes. This one has an audio personality card. I believe its code name was Whisper. And it has an expansion slot for an internal modem, but that is not filled in. Then we have three PCI expansion slots. So there's a lot of functionality and features that you could add to this machine that you couldn't necessarily do with an iMac G3. This personality card is interesting because there were three different versions of this card that you could get. The audio only card was the cheaper option, so that came standard in these machines. There was also a video in and out card. Then there was another video card, which also had a DVD decoder on it, so you could actually watch DVDs on this G3. This is almost like the system tray you would get from an iMac tray loader model where the whole bottom of the system comes off in this one piece, which is very nice. It makes it a lot easier for you to do repairs on this thing or add functionality to it by just pulling the tray out and installing cards, etc. Now it looks like this screw is missing here on this PCI slot, so I wouldn't be surprised if somebody had a card installed there at one point. Now, there are two bays here. This one is standard with a floppy drive, and this one was meant for an iOmega zip drive. Now this is a 233 MHz G3 model, I believe that was the lower end, so it likely would not have come with the zip drive from the factory. So instead you have this blanking plate on there, which is this little plastic uh, cover that makes it look like it has a drive in there. But uh, this has a plastic slit on it, so does this, so <laughs> brittle plastic all around. Uh, we do have a CD-ROM drive here, I believe you could have upgraded that to a DVD-ROM if you wanted to. And then your logic board here is pretty darn similar to a desktop G3. And that's because it uses the same exact logic board. So you have SCSI and IDE built in, so that's nice. But you also have this personality card. Now these personality cards came in a few different revisions. You'll notice that this one has a little connector here. Now this connector plugs into the CRT of the G3 all-in-one, so you have to make sure that if you're upgrading this to a video personality card, that you have this connector on it. Otherwise, it's not gonna work for you. There's also a VRAM slot on here, so you could upgrade the internal video memory because this has an ATI 3D Rage Pro PCI chipset. Then you have three standard memory slots there, and your G3 processor is right here. So let's take this logic board out and see where this damage comes from and what I'm getting myself into. Okay, so following the service manual, it wants me to take out the hard drive, which I forgot to show you, is hiding right here. 
It's actually pretty ingenious because the cables that uh, go to SCSI and IDE are right here and those go down here. So it looks like this hard drive is IDE. Let's try and place the chassis on its metal side to avoid further cracks. There we go. And see if we could get this hard drive out. All right. So this is a four gigabyte quantum hard drive. I have no idea if this works or if there's anything on it. So we'll put that to the side and we can play around with that later. All right, next we have to fuss around with the floppy drive here. It's on those same very brittle carrier sleds. So I'm going to just try and persuade this to come off quietly. We've already had enough broken plastic for today. There we go, put that to the side. And although this is just a blanking plate, I'm gonna take this off too, just to make it easier on us, maybe. There we go. And that just leaves this CD-ROM drive, <laughs> which is caked with dust. So I think we have to unplug the CD-ROM from the back. Uh, yeah, oh boy. Yes, we have the audio cable, which is has a little clip on it. Oh, that's gonna be fun to try and get out. There we go. Uh, we have this IDE cable, which has seen better days. Let's use the pull tab and see if that just disintegrates. Hey, it actually did its job. Excellent. Then we have the Molex connector here. Let's see if this will come quietly. I am being so careful here, but I don't think the odds are in my favor. I'm gonna try and push from the back as I lift this plastic lip up here. Oh, oh, there it comes. Well, that was a close one. Let's see how bad this is. Oh, okay. Got some patina there, a little bit there, but other than that, this is a pretty okay looking Apple CD 24X CD-ROM drive. Oh, just, yeah, look at that. That's just the stuff my nightmares are made out of. Oh, I'm gonna have to wash my hands after this. But, hey, look at that. That, I mean, you, you could hardly see it from where I am, but it looks like there's plastic by where the logic board is over here. Uh, I wonder if that helped or hurt us as far as containing this rust explosion. All right, so next we're gonna take out this personality card. Oh yeah, there's another screw here in the back. I've never really taken out these personality cards because my G3 desktop has the AV input-output card, so why bother? You have the best one. Um, there it goes. Okay, so that's the card there. Okay, so here's the close-up of this audio-only personality card. This is where the modem would go and it would go through that slot if you had that installed. But here is the AIO video connector. That's what's labeled on the board here. So if you were to upgrade this card to say the one with the video in and out, you would have to make sure it has this connector on it. Otherwise you have nothing for the CRT to plug into. Okay, so there's this cable support bracket, metal bar thingamajig. We're gonna remove that. So we have some power connectors here. These all come from this one connector that feeds from the power supply where the CRT is. And so we have this little adapter that would let you plug into the iOmega zip drive if one was installed. So that was nice for them to include. And this one would go down and plug into your CD-ROM drive. And for the hard drive, this actually uh, forks again and goes under there for the hard drive. So let's get all this spaghetti out of the way. This should just lift up. Okay, well we are using every single <laughs> SCSI and IDE connector on this logic board here. We have SCSI plugged in for whatever, and we have the two IDE 
sockets there. I guess one was for the CD-ROM and one was for the hard drive, but maybe SCSI would have been for the zip drive if we had that installed. Oh, that's a lot of dust and sadness. All right, let's take this thing apart and see if we get that logic board out without too much fuss. Then we have two screws holding this down, one in this corner, and the other one was by the grounding wire, which we already took apart. So I think you could just lift this up and out. Let's see how we could do that here. All right, oh goodness. Yeah, <laughs> look at all that rust. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, it's time to look at the bottom of the logic board and see how screwed we are. Three, two, one. Oh, well, that's worse than I expected. <laughs> oh God, that's terrible. And of course it's right by the memory slots and oh boy. <sighs> I mean, it doesn't look that bad. Let's see. And that's why you always want to ask for pictures of the insides of your machine before you complete your purchase. All right, well, I've seen worse, but this is pretty nasty. So I'm just going to put some alcohol on here and just gently try and scrub to see what's coming off and what's not. Now, even on the surface, if it looks okay, you could easily have this rust get into vias and break connections on the board. So the seller told me that this thing just turned on and off when he went to power it on, which <laughs> I understand now because of all the damage to it. But uh, yeah, I mean, that looks a little bit better, but I'm going to really have to look at this under the microscope and probe a lot of these points, especially on the memory modules to make sure that the connections are still being made to where they have to be. And some of these points, are like blackened with rust. So you need to make sure that they are still making connections where they're supposed to. So this is where the memory slots are. This is where the voltage regulator is. And this is where the CD audio connector is. I'm mostly concerned with the voltage regulator because that's important for the machine's functionality. Who cares about the CD audio? Um, I think this comes up by just undoing these little clips. See how terrible that is. Oh, actually, that's not too bad. That looks pretty clean. Now here comes the million dollar question. What the heck caused so much carnage and rust in this lovely little G3? Well, this little half double A 3.6 volt battery. That's right. This little guy just went kablammo and leaked and exploded and caused all sorts of further corrosion. Yeah, this thing might've been stored outside and that probably didn't help or whatever, but one of these tiny little things turned into a battery bomb and exploded and leaked and destroyed this poor little logic board. So what I'm going to try and do is remove this battery. Again, if you haven't watched my little tutorial on this, you just put a screwdriver blade in there and you just press against the outside of the plastic parts. And if it's not exploded, <laughs> it should just come free. There we go. Oh God, that looks terrible. Um, I'm going to try and remove this. Oh, God, that's stuck in there. Oh, and the capacitors next to it just, you know, blew their tops, li literally. Oh, how am I going to do this? Um, oh, gosh. Oh. Yeah, get, get out of there. Oh. I mean, look at the carnage of this. These were once happy little capacitors, which are... Now long gone, and I'm sure they're taking a lot of little components with them, so... Yeah, any hope of me uh, trying out this board today, I think, has been dashed. Anybody want uh, Power Macintosh G3 all-in-one particles? Rare! Look! Now I know what you're going to say, but Steven, that's a Saft battery. It's not a Maxell Super Battery that are always known to explode. Well, it doesn't matter the brand of the battery, or the condition that it's in, or the year it was made, or if it was made in West Germany or not, these things will die and explode and leak. This machine is about 25 years old, so of course these batteries aren't intended to last that long. I mean, just look at this thing. Ugh. I don't think I have the time to fix this board right now. 
There are obviously some capacitors and parts that I have to inspect to see if I could get replacements for them or if the damage is just too far gone on some of these pieces. It doesn't look too bad, but it's going to take some time. But I do have some spare parts. This is a Power Macintosh G3 logic board that should just fit into this all-in-one chassis. And we could hopefully see if the rest of this machine will work after all. Now I bought this logic board off eBay so long ago, I didn't even remember I had it until I was looking through some parts earlier. So let's do a comparison here. It appears we have the same part number, 8200991B. This was made in Singapore and this was made in Indonesia, but we have the voltage regulator on here. We actually have a VRAM module because a lot of these just shipped with the onboard memory. This has some expanded memory, which is nice. We have two of the three memory slots filled in and we have that ROM SIM installed there and everything appears to be okay. So hopefully this board works. I have never tested it to my knowledge. So we'll have to pop it in and give it a go. I think these little rubber pad things actually save the board from further carnage because it lifted it up slightly. And uh, yeah, this whole thing needs to be cleaned, but it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, this rust is gonna be a pain in the butt to remove. If you have any tips for removing it, let me know in the comments section. But for now, I'm just gonna dust this out just to clean it up enough so we can put our logic board in there and try and see if this machine will actually do anything. We're not gonna leave it long term, obviously, because we do need to clean this out better than just a quick dusting. But I am very curious if that CRT and that analog board function at all. Okay, so I am gonna put this logic board inside of here. Sorry, friend. There we go. Perfect fit. Thankfully, the personality card was spared, so we could install that back in this machine. So this is the IDE connector that was plugged into the CD-ROM drive. You can see there's a lot of the rust residue on here. Well, it doesn't look like the rust has made it to this section where the pins actually connect to the cable. So I'm gonna just maybe use this and see if it works. If not, I do have a spare IDE cable we could use. Okay, so now we have to plug this support bar thingy in. Sure. I feel so bad, it's like I'm torturing this poor G3 logic board that had no involvement in all this rust and carnage, but if you work, you'll be the hero of the town. If you don't, I'll put you in a box and put you on the shelf and I'll ignore you for 30 years. You just see the yellowing internally. This stuff never saw the light of day and <laughs> just look at that. This is much tanner than this. Maybe it has to do with the rust. Anyway, I mean, that rust is not going to completely come off this drive here, but at least I'd like to get some of the surface rust off. And yes, I should be wearing gloves, duly noted. Now, although this audio cable looks pretty bad, I don't think the rust has made it inside the connector, which is good. So we should be able to reuse this for the CD-ROM. I'm going to try and slide this in without breaking anything. And we also have to feed the power cable into there, almost forgot. Okay, so we got the audio cable in, got the IDE cable in, and now to plug the power cable in, excellent. And then we have to just snap this back in. Yay! This floppy drive is very dusty, <laughs> so dusty. You can just see the dust bowls hanging out in there. Yeah, that's not good. I gotta take this drive apart, aren't I? Well, it has one of these lovely finger slicing shields on it, which just kept more dust in. Oh gosh. So this is a Panasonic branded floppy drive. This looks to be a similar model of the floppy drive that was in my Power Macintosh 8600 that I recently had to clean out. And I could not figure out how to open that floppy drive other than lifting the lid. It was not clear to me how to remove any of the mechanisms inside, but we are going to clean the heads and just try and get some surface dust out of here. And hopefully that'll be enough for now. Well, that grease has completely dried up, so we'll have to fix that. 
Okay, it's still terribly dusty in there, but at least it's not as terribly dusty as it was before. There, at least it looks a little bit better, although we'll have to do a complete clean out later on. All right, so let's put that floppy drive back in. Now I'm not gonna put the iOmega blanking plate back in here because I wanna make sure that this logic board works before I do anything extra to it. I do have a SCSI iOmega zip drive that can replace this blanking plate. I just don't wanna to get too far ahead of ourselves here. All right, so after much toiling, we have all of the components plugged into this new logic board. And a sane man would have actually individually tested each of these components before putting them in, screwing them down, and committing to this. But I am not a sane man. Okay, so we have a cable of some kind that plugs into the personality card, probably to control things. We also have this RGB video connector for the CRT. We have the power supply that goes to the logic board, and then a power rail that plugs into a splitter that connects to the hard drive, the CD drive, etc. Okay, so we're gonna try and not break this further, hopefully. This just should... Oh. Slide right in there. All right, it's gonna be difficult to see some of this, but basically I'm plugging in things that need to be plugged in. So this is the power supply connector that goes to the logic board that will hopefully not fry it when we try and turn this machine on. We have our RGB video cable, which plugs into the personality card. You want to make sure that is actually secured through these little clamps that plug into it because otherwise you get some weird signals. And this plugs into the top of the personality card, like that. Then we have this rail here that needs to plug into this Molex connector here. And that should power everything. Now you want to make sure that these cables are not sticking up when you're moving this back in, otherwise you could have problems. Okay, so I'm just going to gently guide this in here. Well, so I'm going to leave it ajar a little bit just because if I have to remove it then I don't have to worry about this plastic as much. But uh, yeah, I guess we could turn it around and try and power it on. I almost forgot to install the hard drive. Thankfully it's quite easy. There's that sled that we removed it from before and you could just insert it from this side and then the cables are on the left side. So you just slide it in, wait for the click, and plug in the cables. Let's just try and clean this up a little bit. All right, it's all back together. Now I am blissfully unaware if this thing works or not. I am behind the camera outside of the blast radius. So if it doesn't work, at least I won't be terribly maimed. And if anything goes wrong here, I'm just going to blame my good friend, Sean. So let's plug it in and flip it on and push that power button. It chimed at least. Oh, it's not happy at all. Well, it's, it's, it's trying. Oh, that's CRT. Yep. Yeah, the clock is the least of your worries, buddy. All right, so this logic board has 128 megabytes of memory, and I can't read the rest because the resolution's all screwed up. And that's probably because of the thing. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, let's shut this thing down. All right, well that made a lot of unhappy noises and that was probably the CRT arcing or, um, yeah, maybe dust and crap just getting in that area. I mean, this thing hasn't been on for, I don't know, at least a decade. Unfortunately, we do have some artifacts on the video side of things. And I've seen that before when the RGB cable isn't seated in properly, but I believe it is. So I'm just gonna open the back up, reseat some things and see if that does anything. Okay, I reseated everything and I also removed that memory module for the video slot just in case this was screwing things up. All right, let's see how unhappy it is now. Yeah, I think the video cleared up. Yay! Okay, so this logic board has 128 megabytes of memory. This system was running 8.1, which is, I believe, what this originally shipped with. 
And let's see if there's anything, like games or anything installed. Oh yeah, At Ease, Setup, Netscape, Gumball, whatever that is, Acrobat, a bunch of stuff. Oh, so this logic board is a 266 megahertz model. Hey, that's quite an upgrade. Sweet. Well, it is a bit cranky, but <laughs> this thing actually appears to be working. So that's pretty damn cool. Okay, so it works without this memory module installed, but I also reseated the connectors in there. So let's plug this back in and see if it still works with it. Okay, so let's see if that made any difference. All right, so all the artifacting is gone. That's great. Let's see if we can find how much video memory is in this thing. Oh, that's right. This version of the <laughs> system profiler won't tell us. Um, yeah, but anyway, it's not unhappy-ish, so that's good. Now, since this thing is working, kind of, um, I'm going to shove the back of it all the way in so we could access the CD-ROM drive and test it out. Oh, that's not, that's not a good sound. Oh, <laughs> I don't think I'd want to push any further than that. That's, um, oh, give me a lot of resistance there, but we, we could maybe access the CD-ROM. Well, we'll find out. Well, the button won't reach. I could use this to push the button. Hey. It comes out. Let's see if it'll read a, a disc here. Little Unreal Tournament. Hey, look at that. It reads the disc. Well, I guess we could try and install the thing. Let's see if this floppy disk drive wants to work. It like restarted the finder, <laughs> but the floppy disk shows up. So that's good. Yeah. There might be some security software on here for kids or something like that. So maybe that's acting a little bit weird, but I mean, it works. So that's good. There are some files on here that were accessed in 2002 or 2003. So that's very, very surprising. Bunch of Claris works documents, math blaster. Yay, simple math. Yeah. Well, we didn't install Unreal Tournament just for funsies. We're actually going to try it out. Because this system should have enough resources to run this game decently. I hope. <laughs> I jinxed myself, didn't I? Well, it looks like it's trying at least. Just listen to that hard drive whirl away. I mean, it's kind of running. I think we could adjust this CRT. Hold on a second. Okay, let's try and adjust the monitor brightness. That should just be here electronically. Where's the button for it? Yeah, that's strange. There's supposed to be a geometry button here and it's just not there. <laughs> Where's the system folder? Uh, under web pages? Who put it there? Let's change this awful desktop pattern because I can't even see anything. Eh, a little bit better. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think I want to put a new system on this machine. Well, let's at least try and get online and install those ATI drivers temporarily. And then at least we'll back up the system and wipe it. It was trying to go to phila.k12.pa.us. Well, yeah, you're not going to be able to reach that, bud. <laughs> in all of its janky glory. 
We have FrogFind here, which is a great search engine for vintage computers. You can do a search like, uh, why did Action Retro's Molar Mac work perfectly? Ah, wait, it's because he paid $10 more for his. Okay, so this should be a universal installer package for ATI video cards, including the chipset that is inside of this machine. Whoop. I was about to say, good set of speakers on this thing. I haven't seen that Twitch for a while, so that's a little concerning, but let's try Unreal Tournament one last time. Well, it didn't give us an error that time about the ATI drivers, so maybe we did something right for a change. <laughs> there we go. Hey, it's not as laggy as it was before. I mean, it's still bleh. Ugh, can hardly even see anything. That <laughs> poor IDE hard drive. <laughs> we are running at a blazing eight frames per second. Excellent. <laughs> I couldn't even see him. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is barely playable. <laughs> and this is only at like 640 by 480. This poor little machine. <laughs> you can't even see what you're doing. I mean, the screen's dark and everything is laggy. Awesome. All right, we've tortured you enough today. Time to shut you down. So there you have it, a G3 Molar Mac. <laughs> this thing is ginormous. All 60 pounds of its beige plastic glory is actually blocking the light from my face. But other than blocking light from the surface of the earth, this thing is actually quite neat. I think it's a underrated Macintosh and yeah, it looks weird. It is totally weird, no argument about that, but it's actually quite functional. The screen is bigger than the iMac G3, has more expandability than the iMac G3, and has all the legacy IO that the iMac G3 didn't have. In fact, my dad used one of these for his day job for a long time, and he was a graphic designer. So I think it was just one of these things where it was the cheapest G3 they could get. So. That's the one he got, which is strange because these were only really sold in educational spaces, but maybe they were able to finagle a deal or something like that. I am going to try and fix up the logic board from this thing because why not? It'll make for a fun live stream. But other than that, I think maybe I'll put some upgrades in here. I won't go as crazy as my friend Sean. Eep. Quack. Like goofball, but I do want to see this thing run a little bit faster and we'll put some solid state drives in there or something because that original IDE hard drive does not sound too happy. Well, I hope you enjoyed tinkering around with this poor abandoned Molar Mac. It has seen some better days, but at least we did get it up and running. Kind of. If you want to see what happens to this thing next, please be sure you subscribe to the channel. You could also like the video and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My handle is Mac84TV. But that's about it for now. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you right here next time on Mac84. <laughs> <laughs>